So it's two o'clock and I'm very excited uh, for this post talk to start. As you can see, we have a group of uh, people already in the uh, waiting to talk. And um, I'm Johanna Stadelbauer from the postdoc office. And on behalf of the organizing team of the postdocs, I welcome you all uh, to the start of our second season of post talks. And we're really excited that we have Gerhard Christandl, an alumnus of our university who resides in London, as well as Markus Meschik, who is currently a postdoctoral researcher and resides in Graz, I think. Uh, to uh, share their um, insights about technology enhanced learning, about international careers, about maybe what accounting and video games have to do with each other with us. And as you have all read in the reminder, this uh, talk is being recorded, but not the discussions afterwards. And now uh, who we also have here is our Vice Rector for Internationalization and Equal Opportunities, Mireille van Poppel, who has kindly taken the time to uh, officially open the second season. And Mireille, I would now like to uh, ask for your words of welcome. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you, Johanna, uh, for inviting me to give this, um, let's say, welcome words. Um, since I am vice rector uh, for international, oh, difficult word, internationalization and also equal opportunities, it's of course my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, series of uh, post talks. Um, it is a collaboration between the alumni community mm -hmm. and also the postdoc office. So that's uh, Frau Meyer Kraus and, and Johanna mostly, I think. Um, and in this series, uh, postdoctoral researchers who come from our university, from Graz, um, interview international alumni uh, who left our university already. And of course, that's very exciting because we have many, many graduates who have very interesting careers. And I think that can be very inspiring for the people still working at our university to hear about their experiences and to learn from them. And of course, we're also very proud of our postdoc researchers who still work at our university because they really contribute a lot to our research and our internationalization as well. Um, because many of the postdocs working at our university actually come from abroad. So in that aspect, they contribute to being an international university. And um, I think that's a very important aspect. Um, I myself, coming from the Netherlands, I've been um, in Australia, I've been in Denmark, and now I'm in, in Graz, in Austria. And I think it really brings so much benefits to have been abroad, to have an international network, and to work with, with other people from other cultures and nationalities. Um, I think it is very much inspiring um, to work at such an international level. And it's also, um, of course, helpful and important uh, for the quality of the science um, that we do. So in that regard, I'm very happy that um, Gerhard Christandl um, is here uh, to talk about his career path today with us. I'm sure you will share a lot of insights um, and experiences uh, how you developed your career. And I hope you, and I'm sure that you will inspire many of our younger researchers. And Markus Meschik, uh, I think it's very nice that you are willing to, to interview uh, Gerhard Christandl with your research background. And I'm looking forward to the, to the interview myself. And um, I really appreciate that we have this format of talks and series, and I wish you a very good talk. And I'm also, of course, looking to the other talks in the series as well. And also a great thanks to Johanna, to the postdoc office, and also to the alumni community for the organization of this series. Thank you. Thank you, Mireille. I think this was a very energizing welcome. And uh, I'm now really, really excited for the talk to start. And I would uh, welcome Tina to give her words of welcome as well on behalf of the alumni community. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. A warm welcome also in the name of our alumni team. 
Yeah, through our international alumni network, graduates can stay in touch with the university and former students all over the world. Yeah, at the moment, uh, there are 30 international alumni groups, we call them chapters, which are organized by volunteers, like Gerhard, our guest today, who is a contact person for alumni in London. Yeah, since 2017, as a, for more than six years, Gerhard supports us in the United Kingdom. So thank you so much, Gerhard, for this and being our guest today. Thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you, Tina. And now um, a few more words from me uh, so that uh, you can all get to know our two speakers today. So for our interviewee. Gerhard Christandl is an Associate Professor of Accounting and Technology Enhanced Learning at the University of Greenwich. Have I uh, said that correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Greenwich, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, which is in London. Uh, and uh, he holds a Senior Fellowship in Higher Education there. He is a graduate of the University of Graz. Um, as Tina said, leads the alumni Unigrad chapter London, and he has worked in the UK, Canada, Germany, and Austria. And Gerhard's time at the University of Greenwich was preceded by a career in management consulting. So I think that's very interesting for the finance uh, or in the finance and performance management field. And Gerhard is known uh, and also has been awarded, uh, I think, uh, um, for his innovation in teaching. And uh, in that regard, he also, for example, runs his own channel on YouTube. Uh, YouTube. <laughs> among uh, Gerhard, among your research interests are technology enhanced learning and teaching, business information systems, SAP, also known as SAP for those uh, of us who work in administration, um, and artificial intelligence. And there will be some talk about AI today, I think. And as an interviewer, as an interviewer, we are very happy um, to have uh, Markus Meschik here. He is an ed educational scientist at our university and currently is leader of a research project on the use of financing models in digital games by children and young persons. And Markus Meschik's areas of expertise are social pedagogy and media education. And he did his PhD research on addiction uh, in video games or in digital games. Markus is also active outside academia as a federal expert, for example, and trainer in children's and youth welfare, and uh, is also concerned with open youth work. Uh, we're really happy that both of you agreed to share your experience and expertise. And Markus, uh, I give now over to you and we are all becoming invisible now, <laughs> apart from you and Gerhard. So I um, okay. wish you a good interview. Thank Perfect. You. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, Gerhard and, uh, and I, we had the pleasure to have a little bit of a talk beforehand and we managed to um, find some topics that we could possibly um, talk about, argue about maybe. <laughs> and uh, these topics include um, teaching in university, since uh, I'm a yeah, comparatively uh, new PhD uh, postdoc. Um, this is a, a field that I see, that I see many challenges for myself in. And these challenges do not get any lighter um, looking at current developments in uh, the field of artificial intelligence. And this is, of course, something that we resonated very well upon because it had, uh, turned out to be uh, to have very uh, uh, quite clear views on this development. And uh, I would like to uh, talk about this topic. Uh, Gerhard, uh, we talked about the challenges of um, of uh, of learning and of teaching in university. Um, let's set, uh, let's start where we left off the last time, I guess. Um, and that's fair. Um, how, how do you, or what are the challenges that, that you approached, uh, that, that you encountered as a, as a new PhD or as a new university lecturer and how did they change for you the last years? 
Well, I had the uh, privilege to teach in uh, three countries and then basically saw the differences there. So basically started teaching whilst I was doing my PhD in Vienna. I actually went with one of the former assistant professors uh, from Graz, uh, uh, Christian Rieke, to Vienna. And that was my first time teaching. And uh, my first challenge was that the most of the students were not that much younger than me. So how do you command um, attention and get engagement in a large lecture theater when you basically look like everyone else in there age-wise? Uh, and that took a while to, to get into. But ultimately, what I found out early enough was you have to be really engaged with, your, with, with what you teach. You have to have the, the, the passion for it and, and really be convinced that what you teach there has relevance to them. Um, and then you, you, you capture the audience, so to speak. So ultimately, it is kind of a show that you do in a lecture, and especially if it's large lectures. Yeah, um, it, you need to capture their attention. And how do you capture the attention? That's what I learned early on. Um, you, you need to get the passion on, let's call it the stage, um, across. If you're there and you just want get, to get it over with, as a, as, a, as a teacher, you will not capture anyone in there because then they will not believe you that this is relevant to them, that this is important to them and so on. That was a lesson that I learned early on, luckily, and had a, a colleague, so I did that in Vienna. Um, I had colleagues there, experienced colleagues that were able to guide me. And I think that was also a very important factor that, that observed my teaching, that gave me pointers to more of this, to less of that and so on. Um, then I had my interruption uh, with the management consulting for a couple of years because I wanted to gain uh, industrial experience from practice directly and from direct customer contact um, because I wanted to return to academia and to UK academia at that uh, because I was an Erasmus student from Graz in the UK and that's why I wanted to return and then managed to do that in 2010. And then it was a different cohort of students because it's way more schooled, it's way more uh, structured and organized, at least compared to how the regime was back then in Austria in 2010. Um, and that was a different type of student because they paid a lot of money, uh, very high tuition fees uh, per year. And so there was a kind of a, a customer sentiment so you had to provide value yeah? and um, there's very much uh, a drive behind that. You need to provide value, the, the bang for the buck, so to speak, that they see why, what they are paying for is actually worth it, yeah? which has pros and cons. But um, uh, that's, I remember the first session I had in 2010, September, I was extremely nervous because I did not know what to expect. And I was there thrown a bit in the cold water at the deep end. Um, but again, the, the, the same truth applied. Um, you have to get the passion across what you teach and make it relevant to them. And then you get them. Thank you. I, I mean, um, it's interesting that you said that uh, that um, we, we talked about the idea of uh, students being consumers last time. And uh, the idea of, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a definition of education behind this idea that goes uh, against everything that I, as an educational scientist, understand when I heard the term education, um, meaning Bildung in the German. So there's there's uh, German language. There's no there's no perfect uh, translation for it in, in the uh, into English. Um, but let's let's set that up, that apart. I mean. Uh, when I when I think of of uh, my uh, career as a student in Austria, um, this uh, passion that you just mentioned, um, I must say I rarely encountered it uh, in my teachers, uh, to be honest. Without wanting to criticize them, <laughs> but uh, there was there was not no spark that was ignited in me. Uh, I had to ignite it myself, I guess. So. Um, I wonder because I had one teacher that uh, I don't want to name, but uh, he, he, he came from uh, the USA and he had a totally different style of, uh, of teaching uh, than every uh, German or Austrian teacher I, I had known so far. And he really 
alleviated me. He, he really uh, was, uh, it was very well done. And, and he had a narrative throughout his lectures. And I thought to myself, uh, is this something that's, uh, that's quite Austrian or quite uh, middle European? This idea that you just go out there and, uh, and I mean, teaching is maybe not deemed as worthy as research, or is it uh, the impact of the, of, the, of the system itself that just, uh, that maybe as a researcher, you have to concentrate on your research in order to proceed in your career and not to concentrate on your teaching. How would you see that? Well, in the, in the, in the UK, last couple of years, universities introduced different um, uh, professional development tracks. So I'm on the teaching and scholarship track. So uh, that's why I progress from from the various stages. So lecturer, senior lecturer, now to associate professor. Um, there, the focus is, of course, on the teaching, on the teaching outcomes. It's very uh, metricized in terms of that you have metrics um, that measure quantitatively um, how well um, are students progressing, how successful are your students because of your teaching, have you achieved your learning outcomes, and so on and so forth. So it's much more, um, that's because of the marketization of the, of the UK academic sector, that you have way more measurement behind it, especially performance measures. I think in at least, I compare this to the situation when I left Austria, so I don't know if that has changed in, in, in the last um, decade. But in Austria, you have these big sessions, right? The universities have, what Graz has, what, 40,000 students or so altogether? And in uh, within, or maybe more even in the meantime, um, um, you have these large lectures where when you stand there as a teacher, you don't see the faces anymore because there's a mass of heads, there are a mass of people, and you're teaching to that mass of people. And you don't have these large lectures here. The largest lecture I taught in the UK is probably about 400 students at a time. That's still a lot. But you can at least, you know, you see them. Yeah, you can address them better. Maybe when you have this, this, this passion for the teaching that uh, I don't think matters what context you're in. If you're in Austria, if you're in Germany, if you're in uh, the UK, if you get that passion across, um, doesn't matter which context you're in, you will capture the audience or at least a part of the audience, because there will always some that are not interested. If you have these masses of people in front of you, that's really difficult. Yeah, you have to take a different approach. So I'm not surprised that you say that the uh, American professor had this different attitude to it, because I feel from the American professors that I've encountered, that there's more showmanship behind it. Um, and and uh, that's not the worst thing, because, as I said earlier, ultimately what, what this is, is one person or maybe two or three people are on the stage. And then there's an audience and you need to capture the audience, in this case, with the educational content that you're getting across. And hopefully you can involve them. Now, it's difficult in lectures to involve them because there's so many, but there's ways. Um, in smaller seminars, uh, it's, it's of course easier. There's a more personal relationship um, between the teacher and the students. Um, there's more direct report, uh, and you can build much more trust as well. And they see you week after week. Um, and when you're really into it, it, it gets across. The spark gets across. If, if you are exhausted and it's difficult for you, I have these sessions where I'm I'm not. I'm not engaged myself because I'm maybe tired or, you know, how it is with anyone who works hard have has these days. And I can tell that my students, it, it, it's, it's mirrored onto my students because they, then, then there's less coming back. You know, you have this, this, this saying in, in German, you know, what, what you echo into the, into the forest comes back. And if you have very little to, to, to echo in there, very little will come back. But would you say that there's also um, systematic, also systematic differences between uh, between the universities uh, in the UK and in Austria, for example, when it comes to the appreciation of uh, teaching? 
because for me it always seemed also looking at the orchid system for example that were for a long time that wasn't even possible to insert your teaching experience uh, but only the publications so i i think that generally teaching is uh, a little uh, I, don't, I don't know it, it doesn't get the appreciation it deserves in my opinion and firstly and secondly i wonder if it if it's different in other european countries or other universities in the UK, I think research still rules the roost. Yeah, that's that's still uh, the one that gets more exposure and that that gets more appreciated. Uh, and in the UK, it has been expressed by the Research Excellent Framework, which is a uh, every couple of years, I think every five years or so, universities have to submit to an, a governing body their best outputs. And there is a lot of effort by universities beforehand. Um, we, for instance, we started an internal exercise called GREAT. Um, that's uh, basically where you need to nominate output from yourself. And um, then a panel decides whether the output will be forwarded to the REF exercise. Yeah, so a REF R -A -S -N -R -E -F, a Research Excellent Framework that has been around for quite some time. And of course, there the main emphasis is research. Yeah, that has slightly turned more towards the teaching side with the introduction of career paths that emphasize teaching. You still have to do your research, but it's not as overemphasized as if you were on the research and knowledge uh, exchange track. That's a different track that you can choose, and you can choose that yourself which which track you want to go for. Um, uh, the last um, four years, I think about four years ago, three years ago, I might be wrong there, there was a, an, an, a similar framework introduced called TEF, T-E-F, which is for teaching excellence, the teaching excellence framework, which emphasized teaching output and universities can gain uh, a gold status, a silver status or a bronze status. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the first outcome was a couple of years ago, the first exercise and a lot of universities that were very strong in the REF exercise were a bit weaker on the TEF exercise. Not every university, by say on average. Whereas universities that were, let's say, mid-ranked on the REF were very highly ranked on the mm. TEF exercise, so the teaching. So universities in the UK typically decide what are we? we are we research informed? Are we research driven? Um, is the teaching research informed? There's a lot of nuances in there, but um, the appreciation of teaching per se uh, has gotten better. In my personal opinion, it should be equal because we are an educational institution. We are in high education. Um, I don't want to sideline the research, not in the slightest. It has its place. It has its, its, its importance. But they should ideally be on equal footing and maybe it gets there in a couple of years when this TEF has run a few more times and there's a benefit because ultimately in the UK in particular, same as in, in the US, it's a very marketized sector. Yeah, God, the, the universities are competing against one another for the students. Um, and that is, of course, something that can be promoted. Yeah, we are a gold status university. So the teaching at our institution uh, is outstanding. Therefore, dear students, please come to Greenwich, for instance. It's, 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 it's a big factor in promoting um, a, an institution and its programs and its topics and its schools um, in a very marketized sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, such as the the universities or the number of the students play a big role in the financial support of the university. Yes, uh, yes. But it's no, the same I'm in the Austria. Yeah. It's similar in, in Austria. Austria. What's the tuition fee in Austria at the moment? Is it about 500 euros? Is that is that right? It's it's basically free for for, for most people, but uh, it's only the ÖH Beitrag okay. uh, the, from the from the oof, don't ask me how to translate ÖH. From the Austrian uh, Student uh, Association, for example, um, yes, or Student Interest um, a Group. Um, but I think it gets to it, it might be about five hundred euro if if you if you uh, go over the the minimum of of the required time or not are not an Austrian citizen. 
about 500 euro a, a semester. It's uh, affordable, I guess, in comparison. Yes, <laughs> definitely. I mean, there could be a discussion to be had, what's the right amount? Yeah, I mean, a university needs to finance a lot of things and the money needs to come from somewhere. And uh, uh, these, these fees are typically uh, loaned by the government. So a student pays that back after they're done and then pro rata. So depending on how much income they have post-graduation, they pay that back over a couple of years. Um, but uh, what the right amount is, um, is, is a debate all by itself. Yes. Uh, 500 or like here, current cap is 9,500 pounds per year for undergraduate domestic students. University can ask more of postgraduate uh, of postgraduate students. Yes. Well, that um, might be a motivation in keeping your students interested <laughs> and keeping your teaching on par. Yes, I mean, there's there's always a bit of of, of, of a conundrum there because. Uh, I think it's a bit problematic sometimes that there is the notion that there are customers and clients and not students um, because it can go towards an idea that what they are paying for is the degree. So what they get at the end, what is what sometimes does not come through enough might be that what they're paying for is the education. Yeah, because ultimately the degree is something that they need to work on themselves at the end of the day and and earn yeah, and that but this is, is very something often, you feel in very often it seems to be unclear yes sometimes it seems to be unclear uh, most students know that they are perfectly aware what the tuition fee is for um but sometimes you come across an individual who is not so sure about that what they are actually paying for at the end. Um, and that's easily alleviated by you know, discussing that. What is it that, well, what is your tuition fee paying for? Infrastructure, for instance, um, upkeep, um, mm. IT costs, etc. Well, um, let's go back to the, to the topic of the teaching. Um, uh, but before that, I, I, I just thought of a good question. Um, for me, it would be a good question because maybe some postdoc researchers are uh, watching this interview and I ask you if there's, I mean, you had quite a successful career until now and uh, going on um, as an academic researcher. And uh, I wanted to ask you if you could pin one experience or one um, grant or one thing that uh, you had the, had the impression uh, was uh, very uh, important in your career path. Uh, what would you choose? So research-wise, you mean? For example, I, I let this open. Research-wise, or uh, maybe you knew a person or something. Um, that's a good question. I have to think about that a bit. Yes, the good, good questions are always the wise, ones pro Probably research-wise, the collaborations, because um, I found out that that uh, that was down to a colleague of mine um, who was back at the, in the day uh, uh, teaching at Dublin City University. He's now at uh, Queen's University Belfast. So Martin Quinn, should you see this? Thank you. Um, so he was very important in my in my research uh, career because um, he was already very experienced and had his very own take on papers that you need to get out, but right? ultimately you, you, you want a paper out to fill up your, your list of publications. And he said, there is no bad research. There is always research that might be controversial. There might be research that might be of not much value to some who read it, but ultimately whatever you get out as research is, is a result. Yeah, it has been accepted by a journal. It has been double blind reviewed a couple of times and it's published. Then there is no bad research yeah? because sometimes you might feel, all right, the research question I work on and I had this feeling a lot of times when I worked on my PhD, nobody's interested in that. That's, that's bad what I'm doing. Yeah. So over four years of working on the PhD, you have these moments uh, where you think this makes no sense. Yeah? But um, 
he, he really showed me, not just told me, but showed me by allowing me to work with him. And by now we have published a couple of papers across various fields that there is always something that you can research in your area. Maybe even find something that is not popular at the time, but it is a research output and it will find its audience. It's not, not just about, of course, that's what we're all striving for, four-star and three-star journals and publications, but what you get out is out, it's published. And that I was not aware of that. Yeah, For me, before that, it was more like it has to be three-star, four-star. Uh, I should not aim for anything else and therefore discarding a lot of the other publications and outlets. And I learned it um, that, and, and I learned that that's not the case. Yeah, he, he calls it bread and butter paper, uh, papers. Um, so um, papers that are out there. Yeah, even if it's a, if it's even if it's not ranked. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's it's if if it gets out there, it's out there. That's kind of a comforting right. thought as well, because I guess that uh, I think that many of uh, Young researchers know the feeling of uh, being in a, a field of research that might be quite uh, narrow, and uh, and um, uh, maybe in this narrow field they are exot uh, exotic as well with their research question, such as uh, I experienced it. And uh, to know because I had made the same experience with some of the papers that I published, that uh, although I thought nobody's going to read this, this is so much work I put into this, nobody's going to read this. Uh, I got some feedback. Um, there were a few researchers in the world who uh, researched to the, to the same topic and they read it and or read at least the abstract and the conclusions and uh, the results. And uh, it felt quite good. It felt good to know that um, whatever you're doing has some kind of impact. But what you yeah. essentially said is that uh, your collaboration with this one uh, person uh, helped you with your with your apps. Absolutely, yeah. That, especially in the beginning when I was not really familiar with the research environment in the UK. So in 2010, 11, um, I did not have the lay of the land, as it were. Um, but uh, I, I met him because he was an external examiner at Greenwich. So we have these externals that, that moderate student submissions after the marking of it, after you, you, you awarded uh, marks and so on. Um, and then met him there and then, you know, how it happens, you just get to talk uh, about this and that and then shall we work on something together? I was like, yes, please. Yeah, so it was a very, very valuable. Mm -hmm. So what I got out of this uh, answer is um, that networking might be one of the most um, important factors in proceeding your career. It's not a surprise. I mean, uh, if, if you are in a position as a researcher to churn out papers by yourself as the sole author, uh, if you can do that, fantastic. But I found that uh, typically research collaborations um, with one, two, three people uh, enhance you as an individual way more because you don't bring in the same set of skills and knowledge and have, I mean, I'm, I'm praying to the choir probably saying this, but when you have the a team there and you work on that kind of output, it's very useful. Yeah. One person may be very strong in methodology. Another person may be very strong in quantitative research and another in qualitative research, even mixed research in literature review parts in a critical analysis yeah? and then you bring this together and this that that I'm not strong in each of these departments so I'm always glad if there's somebody I have a co-author or I'm a co-author not the first author and then have others where I can learn how to approach this how to approach that so for instance I completely switched from quantitative in for my PhD to qualitative research um, and uh, I'm a bit out of touch, I have to admit, with quantitative research methods. So I'm always glad that if we do a quantitative paper, if there's somebody on the team who is an expert in it, fantastic. Because for me, it's not just a refresher, it's also what's, what's the current status for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So yes, if you can network, collaborate with others, great, do it. I think it is. Uh... 
I think it's important to, to, to mention that another time because many of the of the uh, of my colleagues that are finished with the PhDs right now did it uh, during the pandemic, and the pandemic was a time where networking was uh, quite hard, if not impossible at times. Yes, and uh, and also me myself, I I know very little, very very little researchers on my field, um, and it's also because of this, because of the fact that the the um, the 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 tagungen can you help me with the word? thank Con you conferences? the yeah. conferences i attended were mostly online so um and, and the online conferences had a very sad spark to them a sad aspect to them because uh, you were in the middle of people and then you pressed the button and you were at, at your home it was totally silent i don't know how you experienced this, this, uh, that but so i think it's very important that you mention this again and speaking of a pandemic and and uh, teaching in the pandemic i think it might uh, 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 to, uh, to transition to the, to, to the topic we were talking about beforehand. Um, I had the feeling that many of, our, of my colleagues were um, at the beginning quite overwhelmed with the, with the usage of a new technology in order to uh, do homeschooling or to uh, proceed with the teachings at university as well. Um, and we talked about this last time because of the of the um, developments in the artificial intelligence uh, sector and the possibilities to uh, implement these um, developments in the teaching. Uh, would you say that knowledge of these new kind of uh, of I mean, this is more complex than using Zoom. <laughs> using ChatGPT or, or, or artificial intelligence is a step uh, farther than using Zoom as a, as a tool. Would you say that this is a requirement for teachers in the upcoming years? For my personal opinion, it should be. Um, for a simple reason. The pandemic has accelerated this um, use of video conferencing systems such as Zoom, Teams, Google Meets, WebEx and whatnot. Uh, a lot, just as you say, and here was the same situation. This was a switch from one moment to the next lockdown. And I remember back in March, 2020, we received the, the email on the Sunday that from the next day, the campus would be locked down. Everything needs to be online. So this was very sudden and we didn't even have the technology ready for that at the time properly. Then switched over to Teams as the platform and um, then we were aware that this was this would impact a lot of our teachers because it's not merely um, showing your slides via Teams because that doesn't do it. You need to do you need to have a different pedagogy. Uh, you need to uh, uh, learn how to how do you engage your online students? Yeah, so the ones uh, how to do that? They're using the chat, they're using interactive um, exercises and so on and so forth. How do you run your assessments if we cannot join? And all of that has accelerated the use of, of these kind of technologies a lot. Uh, and the thing is, because you ask, will this, is this, will this be relevant? I say yes, because uh, it has not just impacted the education sector. It has impacted pretty much every industry that is especially service industries. So for instance, my wife, um, she's working at a, a consulting company and uh, she can work a lot remotely luckily, because she can do her job very productively uh, remotely. And that has been an, a development enabled by the pandemic and the, the technological advances. So what I'm saying is that uh, companies will use that kind of technology in the future, just like AI will be part and parcel of what students then graduates will be working with. Uh, that is, um, in, my case, in, in my view, a fact it will stay. Yeah. Uh, it will not just dial back to 2019 pre pandemic. Yes. No, uh, so, I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you. Um, I just wonder because uh, in my experience, I mean, uh, you're a very tech savvy uh, lecturer, uh, having your own YouTube channel and um, being knowing a lot of, of, of or being on touch, in touch with the current development. And I myself, uh, Maybe not as much as you, but I would also qualify my, I think I would qualify myself uh, in the more tech savvy region. But then there's uh, colleagues uh, that, are, that have other fields of interest personally and uh, professionally. 
and I had the I had the impression that they uh, did adapt to this kind of um, new media, new technologies, uh, only as much as it was absolutely necessary. And uh, they have maybe they, they learned how to do breakout rooms in Zoom after a few years or months, but uh, th there was no going beyond that. And in my uh, opinion, that's perfectly understandable, yes, because uh, uh, there's a lot of other things to, to learn and to know in this world. But um, what would be the what would if you if you could pinpoint it, what be, would be the minimum requirement when it came to AI for you? I think the minimum requirement is to not restrict it when it doesn't need to be restricted. So there might be situations where you need to restrict it, not ban it. That's a difference. Um, banning means that you completely forbid it entirely, maybe even as an institution. And some institutions in the UK do that. It will not work because it will be part of the workspace in the future. And that's where the students, before they join a university here, they will start asking questions. Are you using AI? Is this incorporated? Can, is, is AI a part of your accounting education, your finance education, your marketing education? Or if we go beyond the business school, uh, is, is AI used in engineering? So I learn how to use AI as a future engineer. Um, of course, we have uh, many that were just overwhelmed by this. And this is this rings a lot of bells for me from back in uh, just three years ago when we switched to online teaching because it was so sudden and so immediate and therefore overwhelming that many were left behind. And it was very difficult for, for them to catch up with this, at least to a level where they say, I'm comfortable using Teams or Zoom in my teaching I don't have to do, I don't need to use fancy stuff. Yeah. I just want to teach and keep my students somehow engaged. Uh, and there's various ways uh, towards that. But of course, and, and the, the, the average teacher who is not so keen on tech just is happy when the PowerPoint works and the computer doesn't crash and they can do their teaching. Um, those are those uh, that that uh, need to be taken with. You can't leave them behind, and that this is sometimes very difficult if the developments are so quick and so overwhelming. We just experienced that now with with artificial intelligence. I mean, it has been around before. It's not new. Yeah, uh, everybody who has an Alexa at home or an OK Google and converses with them that is ultimately artificial intelligence. Everybody who used that Google Translate. That is artificial intelligence or a designer in PowerPoint. It's just because this generative AI is so accessible to the public and easy to use that it has taken the center stage now. And now one development comes after the other extremely quickly. And I'm not surprised that this is overwhelming. I, I have trouble keeping up at times. Where do I look? Do I look at text base, image base? voice space, what do I look at and how can I use this in my teaching? And I do have the privilege that I teach IT heavy subjects with mm -hmm. accounting information systems and enterprise resource planning. Others where it's not as accessible to an IT base or support, let's say ethics. How do you, how do you use artificial intelligence in ethics when learning technology might not have featured as prominently in a field like that? There are ways, mm -hmm. but it's of course it's it requires it requires a, a new mindset of those that that are in those fields that are not logical for this kind of technology to be used. Yes. Well, it also requires time. It requires yes. a lot of time to to sit down and uh, and get to know this kind of technology at first, because uh, I, I mean yeah. I mean the, the model in our uh, institute. Uh, for many seminar courses with about 20 people or maybe 30 people, if it's a big one, um, is always, uh, is always to write, a, a, a thesis at the end of the, of the seminar of about 20 pages and, uh, on a topic, they, the students chose themselves, um, in according, according to the, to the teacher, uh, or the lecturer, and then, uh, the lecturer gets to, gets to rate this, this thesis. I mean, uh, it's very easy to to write a thesis uh, in 20 pages with a AI like uh, ChatGPT that I will never find out if it if it's written by an AI or not. If I don't have the if I'm not tech savvy enough, I don't take the time to 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 do my research on this. 
And so, I mean, um, also in ethics, I guess, I, I guess, uh, yeah, it provides very many possibilities to to implement uh, to, or to be implemented in the in the in the courses because because ethics is arguments and ethics is uh, being philosophic, quite logical, and so you can you can play around with ChatGPT and uh, find counter arguments or, or or try to argue with ChatGPT on an ethical question. Which would be really hard <laughs> because they have access yeah. to very many uh, theories, uh, to all of them most probably. So, uh, yeah. are there any 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 any? How 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 do you implement it in the in your, in your teaching right now? Or is there some? So, some I, I I used it. I used ChatGPT back then based on three point five. So we've currently GPT four as the as the mm -hmm. as the more as the main model, which is more powerful, but three point five when it really became very prominent first time in January this year uh, in an accounting information systems class uh, about emerging technologies. And one of the topics therein was blockchain. So we, uh, I, I try to teach the students, what is a blockchain? How does it work uh, with an online resource? That's not artificial intelligence has been there for around for some time, just to, you know, to get the idea, what is it? How does it work? And then we programmed one. Since my module uh, or course is not a programming one, I used uh, ChatGPT to write um, a code in Python for me and for us, the class. And then we let this code run to see how would this actually look like? How would a blockchain actually look like uh, uh, if it was non-encrypted? And the, I gave ChatGPT the example, uh, write a, a blockchain for me, five blocks. Um, based on uh, create sample data for a bakery in Sweden, and it did that. So had the, had the bread, croissant, etc. In every blockchain for every sales transaction. So I asked it to do sales transactions there, um, and then in Swedish krona the the amounts and said that this is how it looks like. Yeah, and the thing is, it allows me to venture a bit out, a bit more without necessarily needing, in this case, the coding skills, because mm -hmm. the students, they can't code. Mm -hmm. uh, I had another situation where I used it as a discussant. I told it, uh, you are a, a, a business partner and a client and we're consultants. And now we, we, are, we are having a pitch. Yeah, we are doing, uh, we are training or we are exercising. How do we pitch a project or project outcomes to that client? So he had a, a conversation with ChatGPT in this case. And it did a decent job, not perfect, not human-like, you could tell, mm -hmm. but to get into it as a supporting technology was great. Um, I have not used it yet at uh, GPT-4 um, because we, we're done with the semester, but I intend to include it way more next year, not just ChatGPT, GPT, there's other AI offerings out there, uh, which would make it very interesting to, to use in teaching i think it's it's interesting that you said that that it didn't work perfectly because uh because it couldn't simulate as a simulate simulate a human perfectly because that, that is what a human is kind of about to not be perfect so uh it, if it if, it's it, per, it, if it would be perfect it, it would it would be uh, able to simulate imperfections uh, of a human behavior it's true, but the thing is, it, it, it lowered the threshold, the barrier, the anxiety level of students engaging. Mm -hmm. Because if we simulated that with an actual human being, you might have students that are just, you know, they are anxious, that they are afraid they might sound, for want of a better word, stupid when they speak or so. So they can, they can exercise that because that's an, that's an AI, that's a computer program. Mm -hmm. um, and so they can exercise this before, you know, mm. it was, was very useful. Mm. But it was so. actually good that it was not human sounding in this case. <laughs> well, yes, um, thinking about, uh, thinking about uh, counseling when it comes to, to AI, this is kind of dystopian also for me, because, uh, because what, what counseling also, what, what makes every human interaction uh, for me uh, worthwhile is the, the the aspect of relation, and uh, and this might be a um, very parasocial. It's called relation. If if there is one side of the of the of the of the partners does feel related, the other side is just uh, very logical kind of uh, 
the psychopathological <laughs> in truth yeah I mean, what, what needs to be very clearly said, because I had the impression in a couple of webinars that I participated recently, that sometimes there seems to be a confusion what this AI actually can do. So what we have here is a generative AI. It predicts the next word according to a massive database um, and statistics, basically, to, to put it very bluntly. What we don't have is a sentient AI, so the Hollywood mm. movie AI, mm. like uh, those of you who know Terminator, the movie, where we have Skynet that takes uh, to tries to destroy humankind. That's not the same kind of AI. Yeah? Sentient AI is an AI that thinks by itself. Yeah, and generative AI, we need to power prompt it and interact with it. In this case, by text, if it's ChatGPT. So if sentient AI exists, I wouldn't know. Maybe it's hidden somewhere. So that's for the conspiracy theorists. Um, but um, what we have now is not sentient. So this AI will not destroy the world, but will enhance our teaching. Uh, there might be negative uh, things that you can do with it. And you can find plenty of examples around online how to turn ChatGPT into an evil bot. but Hopefully, yes, uh, I think it should enhance teaching. I think it needs to be embraced. It will be the reality, not just for education, but for the workplace and for private society. Let's put it that way. It has been around for some time already. It will become more prominent in future. So it's, it's going to be there, like it or not, but we need to deal with it. Gerhard. Yeah, Johanna is, Johanna is, uh... Already. Eagerly. <laughs> <laughs> Eagerly to talk. <laughs> Eager to talk. Thank you, Markus, for your very stimulating questions. And thank you, Gerhard. Um, I think this was very insightful, what you covered so far, the ground you covered so far. And we have some experts also in university teaching and learning and digital environments here. And we got the question from one of them, who is... Uh, Simone, and she uh, wants to learn a little bit more about how you both maybe, or how Gerhard specifically is using Twitch and perhaps other technologies in your classroom. Gerhard, can you talk a little bit, bit about Twitch? So I haven't used Twitch in the classroom. What I have used Twitch for was out of a, a sentiment and feedback from the students when we locked down that they felt isolated. Yeah, and uh, what I wanted to provide to them was a platform that was a non-teaching platform. So where, the to where there was no teaching, there was no class, but a kind of a social, uh, an, a digital social get together. So I, I, I did not come up with the idea. Uh, another professor in the, in the UK that I know, uh, Chris Headland, is a professor currently at Staffordshire and he's teaching uh, video games. Um, so for the industry and directly related to the industry. And I watched one of his streams and what he did was he invited guest speakers whilst they were playing Sea of Thieves in Twitch or on Twitch. Uh, and and uh, that was very interesting. And, and what I, then I got in touch with him and learned from that. So basically he said the, the game is not, not as important. It's about the social interaction in the, in the Twitch chat, that, that they talk to one another, they talk to you. It's a relaxed environment. It's not about a learning outcome. It's not about an assessment. And I did that um, when usually when you would be streaming video games, you know, can be um, typically was in the evening in my case and uh, picking a video game that was had had downtime. So you could engage with the people in the chat. And then you had those times where we had maybe like, no, if you're in video games, you have a boss fight or you hunt a monster. In my case it was Monster Hunter. Uh, that I played, and this this uh, created a sense of community and belonging. And I know from feedback that uh, in some it 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 mitigated this feeling of isolation that they felt. Yeah, they couldn't leave the house, uh, they couldn't interact with anyone. I invited back then I've taught across all of our three years, invited everyone in, here's the link, join, I'm going to be online, you come in or it's up to you how, how you want to do that. And then we're interacting with one another, with me, it was great. So that's what I used Twitch for. Uh, and this was, uh, I feel also created a good atmosphere 
when it would come to the online classes, because they've seen me in between, they've seen me in a different uh, role, not as the teacher, but in this case, a video gamer um, that that's, you know, tries, just tries to interact and engage uh, the audience uh, with the video game and, and, and with me as the video game streamer. So that's what I used Twitch for. I have to admit my channel is a bit dormant at the moment. That's mostly because of time restrictions uh, that I can stream, but I intend to pick it up again and move over to YouTube with that because it's um, for various reasons, seems to be a, a better model at the moment for, for game streamers. Um, Simone says uh, this reminds her of Gilly Salmon's stage of online socialization and its importance in her five stage model. Does this ring any bells for either of you? Um, Gilly Salmon online I socialization. Admit, I do admit my ignorance uh, about this model, but um, with online socialization, yes, uh, we, we had this. Uh, there were a lot of Complaints. I don't want to call them complaints. Um, messages that they felt isolated, and that was not a, a, an uncommon thing to happen, right? Especially if you live by yourself, um, you can't get out. Of course, you feel isolated, and you feel the human interaction. That was a way of not replace it one to one, but at least have some kind of community platform available. So that was the idea. So Marcus, uh, what do you do with Twitch? Um, essentially nothing. Uh, I use a Discord. Ah. Uh, I did use, use Discord when the, during the pandemic because um, many of the institutions of open youth work um, proceeded to, uh, to uh, get in contact with us for the first time because it would help to setting up Discord servers. Because Discord is maybe not as as uh, user friendly in the first minute as many of the other platforms, but it's essentially very easily done. And they set up um, Discord servers, and they had uh, with the, with the idea in mind that the people, the, the youth that would come to the youth of uh, youth um, stationary centers, yeah. centers, yes, would come to the Discord servers, which very uh, little did, but new people came. That was very interesting for me. People that would never have come to the youth center suddenly came into the Discord channel and, uh, and they had activities together. And then some of them also came to the youth center uh, afterwards. So it was, was uh, an idea to opening the, the, the youth work up to new, new customers, customers, new address and the participants, participants. Yeah. And we did our, uh, one of my uh, seminars, we, uh, held up, we held in the, in the Discord server. And it was a very, very a big challenge because many of our students, of my students, had big problems setting up the Discord, uh, setting up the program, having problems with mics, having problems with with cameras. And this was 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 two years in the or one and a half year in the pandemic, into the pandemic. So that's what that's what that's why I always kind of uh, critical when I when I think of uh, of the possibilities of the of AI or of new media, because I know that some people will have the possibilities to use them if they have the time, the energy or the resources, or the interest. Yeah, the resources or the interest <laughs> uh, to, to sit down and, and um, learn them. The others, I'm, I'm not sure. I, th I think it's interesting. So you as a teacher work with people who might be uh, working as youth workers, for example, and they need to create spaces for people, for example, from migrant uh, backgrounds or um, who live in in stable housing situations uh, to socialize and to build a community with them. And it's a bit different to what Gerhard does, but still you, you create online spaces for the people to feel connected to you as a teacher and then also to learn some digital skills as well, uh, maybe. And um, I now need to bring this talk to its end because it's one minute to three. And um, I, I and Tina as well, we really appreciate that you took the time and all the insights you gave us. Do you have some two words of goodbye or some wisdom you want to share uh, at the end here? 
I'll leave uh, Gerhard the last word. Uh, thank you very much for your insights, Gerhard. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Markus, for the uh, very interesting discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, words of wisdom, don't, don't fear technology. That's, that's my word of wisdom, because that's what I usually tell the people here. Don't fear it. Try to explore it. Super. Perfect.